But yeah, this is the construct uh, author's response to constructivist worldview by Bin Lu in construct in constructivist foundations from 2022. In this response, I, oh, ah, what happened there? Okay. <clears throat> In this response, I tried to clarify my point of view and address the concerns of my con commentators. However, while my target article focused on a relatively narrow topic, the problem of stuff in Goodman's constructivism, the commentaries have opened up a much larger context, which I can only outline in this response. So while I am grateful for the many suggestions of my commentators, the numerous details have to remain remain sketchy at best. I will deal with them in detail in further papers. Okay, so the totality of experiences. Jan Westhoff, or Jan Westhoff, in Chapter 2, acknowledges that I take the totality of experience as a con constructance to avoid the problem of solipsism. This is roughly my method, but more clarifications are in order. First, my argument for the view that all features, properties in the world are constructed include two parts. One, all properties in the purported external world can be constructed from the totality of experience. And two, the properties in each particular experience are also mutually constructed. Okay, constructed from what, my friend? What are things constructed? If they're constructed, what are they made out of? If we construe the totality of experience as the basis of construction, it is the basis only from the perspective of part one. It is not the case that all properties on this basis are constructed earlier than any external feature. For example, the LC green spot in a person's visual uh, experience is constructed later than the PC property of being a point of light in the sky constructed from dinosaurs, a dinosaur's visual experience. The order of construction of properties roughly follows the arrow of time from the distant past to the future. I do not demonstrate the order of the construction using the totality of experience. Rather, I demonstrate a way to understand all features as constructed by dividing them into purported external properties and experiences. All right. So basically right here, everything's constructed. And then he's going to just say, look, it's the arrow of time that they are constructed along with them. That's fine. But that's a description. That's not an argument for it. It's just saying everything is constructed and it's constructed in time. That doesn't explain anything. That's just saying this is how I define it. So nothing is explained here. It's just saying, all right, things are constructed over time, not explaining how. So we have no knowledge of how things are constructed or even what constructed means at this point. Just because they are following time, that doesn't explain the method of construction or what they're made out of. All right, so three. Second, the target article does not try to clarify which objects have experience and which do not. This can be construed as an empirical question. We usually accept that other people and even animals have experience. When we consider the construction of features, the question is whether we need to exclude other people's experiences rather than whether we can access other people's experiences. My argument in section 35F is about whether there is a criterion in principle according to which we should exclude other people's experiences from the construct tens. In section 36, I argue that we should remove the structures associated with a person, a body, or a self or subject from the layer of construct tens because the set of constructions for all properties does not require these structures. Okay, so this is again making a massive claim. You're saying you don't need a body to experience the world. This is the old thing. If a tree falls in the forest, is there anyone that, and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? This person's saying no, there was already a sound because it's constructed in some way. But again, what does it mean to have a subjective experience? It means that there is some sort of thing there that has a subjective experience. This person has just defined themselves out of all consciousness. You do not need consciousness in this universe. It is constructed out of something. And then they're saying whether or not there is consciousness is uh, empirical. They just said that up here. Um, yeah, this can be construed as an empirical question, but they're not telling us what it is they're just saying it's not my problem so right here they're defining themselves out of uh they're doing a radical sort of uh physicalism where whatever their construction materials are is a um you know that's their entire ontology and then they're saying well if there's consciousness or anything like it we don't even have to worry about it because we're going to construct it out of the other stuff so they don't they're just already declaring it non-fundamental like there is no psychology here 
there it's just um, more construction stuffs. But that, again, a lot of people would disagree with that. Okay, if this removal is reasonable, again, major red flag. No idea if it's reasonable or not. A lot of people are going to disagree with that. A person's experience becomes a group of connected experiences, group A, just like the group of connected experiences of many people. Yeah, so we've got things floating in space, have nothing to do with your body. Suppose that it is acceptable to take group A as construct hands. I investigate whether group B can also play the role of construct hands, and I check whether the different connections between experiences in group A and group B make a difference to their ability of construction. How would you actually be able to... Uh, understand what the differences are between two groups of abstract experiences. There is no uh, subjective experience here that you have access to because it's already constructed. And so you can't actually compare A to B because there's no, there is no A and there is no B. There is only the construction. And then you're just looking at, well, is it the same thing or not? And you already have the answer. So I already think that's a little funky. But uh, again, this is just really fast off this sort of um, response sort of uh, the responses here. Four, related to this difference, opponents may answer that an experience in group A can know or match or share or grasp other experiences while an experience in group B cannot if the other experiences in question are other people's experiences. Yeah, so it's like, can you match your experiences to something else, but can you match someone else's to yours? Maybe that's harder. But again, what are we even talking about here? I don't know. Arthur says, I will demonstrate that this view is an inference from rather than evidence for the view that at the level of constructants, there are structures associated with a person such as a body, self, or subject. Yeah, this is what I was just saying before. They were denying this, and so they're agreeing that they're denying it here. And so that makes the above question illegitimate. So like, can you actually compare them? I was saying you can't, or you, you it doesn't make sense to even ask that, and then this is the question, should you ask that? And the author is saying no. So it looks like my analysis was on point. Yay. Anyway, continuing. An opponent for reason for such an an opponent's first reason for such an, an answer may be that they the experience of group A is accessed by the same self or owned by the same subject. However, we have removed these structures. Yeah, these are gone. There is no person anymore. Their second reason may be that the connection between different experiences is, for example, memory in group A and linguistic communication or through uh, through observ. Uh, yeah, through observing behaviors in group B. What's up, Rethius? How you doing? Welcome in. Uh, we're reading this about a short article on constructivists. So where everything in your the world is constructed. Not sure of what, though. Okay. However, this raises the question. Why can one experience no other experiences when they are connected by memory, but cannot know other experiences when they are connected by language or observing behaviors? An opponent's response may be that memory is the connection under the same self or subject. However, we have removed self or subject. Roughly speaking, the connections between different experiences in group A or group B can both be regarded as one experience having knowledge about occurring, the occurrence of another experience. Yeah, we've got two constructions here, and one just has information about the other. That's all it is. I will continue to ask why the knowledge gained by memory can play the role of constructants, but the knowledge gained by language or observation, b observing behaviors cannot play the role of constructants. The difference may be how vividly an experience can be reproduced by memory or by language or behaviors. In my view, whether we should exclude certain experiences from the set of constructants is one question, and how vividly an experience can be recalled or reproduced in another experience is another question. Yeah, so again... Basically, if everything's construction, you just get to pick it. This author is saying, well, you have to pick and choose which ones are um, allowable. Like, that's what they're doing here. They're saying the subjective experience is not an allowable thing, but this is defining themselves out of the problem because this is basically, like, this is exactly what they did. They define themselves out of this problem because they removed subjective experience right there. And like I said right here, they did that here. Remove the structures associated with a person. Boom. There is nothing what it is to be a person. There is nothing about what it is to be a bat. Rethia says, that seems like a common sense assumption to me. The dude convinced chemistry and convinced chemistry and biology is all we are. Yeah, I mean, if that's, if this is your worldview, if you are a hardcore 
a physicalist and you don't think there is anything like psychology that is independent from the biology or mind, then maybe that's all that there is. But you're going to have a hard time um, maintaining this forever. And if you just define your uh, everything this way, that's fine. You can define yourself that way, but you have to understand that's not going to fly in the ter- in the face of experience. Like that's fine in terms of like an abstract philosophy, but it's not going to work in the everyday. So you're going to have to do something else um, a lot of times. Like you can't refer to biology when going talking about psychology. It just doesn't like you can't make that reduction you can't understand sociology or history by looking at our biology it's just not going to work and so you can do it in the abstract but you're not going to do it practically (coughs) all right experience without mind yep and we're just doubling or tripling down on this whole thing um no mind it's all just you know like i said the physics of it Five, contrary to Westerhoff, the constructivist, the constructivist worldview does not need an immaterial mind. Yeah, I mean, again, ancient debate at this point, or no, at least since Descartes. I mean, it's just Descartes. But like we've been arguing about this off and on hundreds of years, if not thousands. Like you think you're going to solve the problem here? No, but like you can be in this camp. That's fine. Like a lot of people are in that camp. A lot of people aren't though. And it's not like I'm just saying many people. I'm saying like actual like good philosophers are not in that camp. We were you can read stuff um by Chalmers and it's like he's kinda in the camp, but kinda not. It's like extended mind thesis. A lot of things going on in this world. Uh, and then philosophy talking about the mind. First, a particular experience in the constructivist worldview should be understood as a collection of properties or as an occurrence of a bundle of properties. Second, I agree with Rudolf Carnap's view that experiences should be construed as neutral until we construct the side of mind and the side of matter. Uh, what is a side of mind and a side of matter? I don't know. Moreover, according to the construction in part one, objects in the purported external world, hereafter external objects, including brains, are constructed from experiences. What the hell are experiences? Experiences, experience as constructins, is not generated from the activities in the brain as constructandum. Um, just so you know, when you say constructans and constructandum, um, you're saying the thing to be constructed and the thing that is doing the construction the, the the thing that the construction is made out of so experience as something that is to be uh constructed is not generated from the activity of the brain as the th- the brain is not what is constructing it like the constructandum not the pieces that are ex- uh constructing experience but like this is uh you can hear that this is just a formalism out of old uh, philosophy uh ex- uh, explanands the thing to be explained and the explanandum which is the explanation and so they're just using constructands as the thing to be constructed and constructandum as the constructing pieces okay so it's not the result of perception of external objects as the constructandum either so it's not your experience is not also it's not constructed from external ob- the perception of external objects In other words, there is merely a constructive relation, but no generation relation or perceptive relation between experience and external objects, including brains. Considering the situation in a dream helps us to understand the point. Suppose a person dreams that they are working in a garden. Objects in the garden, including their body or brain in the dream, are constructed from the experiences that occur in the dream. However, the experiences in the dream are not generated from the activities of their brain that is in the dream, nor are they the result of the perception of the objects in the garden that is in the dream. There is only a constructive relation, not a generation relation or a perceptive relation between experience in the dream and their brains in the dream or objects in the garden. Yeah, I mean... How do you explain dreams? Are you actually experiencing a world at that point? Maybe. But they're saying, look, basically your brain's just generating it. So it's not constructing, your experience is not constructed out of it. You're in some sense constructing the experience some other way. I don't know how though. Like what exactly are you doing when you're dreaming? You have to postulate some sort of imagination at that point. But then that's ex nihilo. You're not, you can't explain how we're actually constructing the world in our mind unless you actually go back to a uh, 
immaterial mind. Oh no! Uh, sorry, I just saw your uh, note, Tindarios. But whatever, we're reading it now. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay, so we're doing experience without mind still. If there is no perceptive relation which requires a mind as the opposite side of matter, the constructivist worldview does not need to invoke mind as the opposite side of matter, external objects. Therefore, the constructivist worldview is not subject to the mind-matter dichotomy. Experience remains neutral in the entire process of construction. This is consistent with the idea that structures that are usually associated with mind, a body, self, or subject are, are, are also removed from the layer of construction construct hands. In agreement with Goodman's claim that constructivism is not a kind of idealism, the constructivist worldview does not imply that purported external objects are mind-dependent. Rather, it rejects the view that any features can be independent of experience without mind, and rejects independent existence as a valid structural feature. Uh, what? So... Wait, wait, wait. What is this? So, it's not a kind of realism. Um... But they are denying that it is mind dependent. So it rejects any feature that can be independent of experience without mind. Uh, but it's okay. So it's all mind dependent, but we don't know how the mind is constructing anything. That's fine. Okay. Since I reject the general relation, Westerhoff is concerned that my my view is in conflict with content, contemporary naturalism. Yeah, they're saying basically it has to do with your mind. We're not exactly explaining how, but that makes it non-natural because it's constructed out of the mind somehow. However, empirical equivalence between the constructivist, constructivist and realist worldview is a powerful reason to reject the views that take material things as their foundations. Empirical evident equivalence means that the observed experience and observable experimental data are the same in the two worldviews. Thus, the argument for preferring the realist worldview are merely based on the different patterns of thought which we use to analyze these observed experiences or data and draw conclusions. However, arguing for a realist worldview by virtue of a pattern of thought is not a strong argument and is to a self to an extent self stultifying yeah but you just did the same thing he like you just did the same thing here author you're basically saying uh where is that uh where is this thing the sense yeah however empirical equivalence between the constructivist and realist worldview is a powerful reason to reject the views they take the material things as their foundations they're basically saying that because if you like the way that constructivism and worldview is you take that together then you can reject the other view but i don't expect anyone that's not a constructivist to take this as a good argument i mean yeah you might really like it it might be really cool but that's not going to convince the other side that only convince people who are already in agreement with you um like the equivalence between constructivist and realist it's like yeah well they're just going to deny that it is equivalent okay so now we get the problem of time uh, Robert Schwartz and Curtis Carter are concerned with the problem of time, which is closely related to the problem of stuff. Um, all these sections, as a typical example of various properties, uh, they take a properties of a star. I argue that the manifestations of each property is not prior to the appearance of the associated constructants. The key point is that a commonsensical object is constructed as a bundle of properties and the individual properties do not need, need to manifest at the same time. Thus, for example, the manifestation of the LC properties of a star can be postponed until after the appearance of language. Moreover, once we involve the PC properties, the construction of properties can be earlier than the appearance of language or human beings. Ooh, ooh, okay. So they're going to say it had the properties, but the properties were not constructed until we came up with them later on. And so what is doing the construction at this point? I mean, we are, but that makes it much more sound like that we are doing the um, construction than it is prop a property of the star. Because if it's waiting for us to view it, again, if the tree falls in the forest and we have to be there to hear it, and we don't, it doesn't make a sound until we do hear it. It makes it sound like we do need to be there. You know, that is part of this. There is some sort of thing that's construction, but like that's kind of at odds with what was getting said earlier. So that kind of makes me worried. Okay. How much more of this do we got? I know this is really fast. Ugh. 
I don't want to do this. It's kind of long. Oh, shoot. Oh, well. Gonna g try to get through this. Frank Big Time says, How could it shine blue light if we don't have a word to distinguish blue and from green? Um, that's what it seems like is the difficulty here. They're saying that it becomes a blue light, that it gains the property of blue um, when we come up with the idea of blue. Um, yeah. Yeah, but once I'm in it, Tindarius, I might as well get through it, you know? Um, it's like, that's not on you. That one's on me. Like, you can suggest it, and I chose to re read it. Um, so this is the worry, though, Frank. How could it shine blue light? It's like, it looks like they need, they were saying that you need some sort of mind in general. You just don't need the mind at any given point. It's still constructed. Um... So, yeah, it's hard. This goes back to um, the new riddle of induction, actually, where you could say, look, maybe things aren't as we thought they were, are, but in the future, like, there'll be new concepts and we'll have to convert them. How can we know that things are what we say they are when, like, blue could turn into green in the future? And this was actually called Gru. And you can look this up. Gru as a color. If something is green now, but in a hundred years it's going to turn blue. How do you know that our concept of green isn't actually grew? Because everything that's green really means uh, grew. Because in a hundred years it's all going to turn to blue anyway. How would you know? We don't. And so how do you actually say that things are green at that point in an inductive way? <sighs> yeah. So this uh, one, these are one of the tough questions. All right. Now my voice is going too. Anywho. All right. So where were we? A point. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. But this makes me very worried that like they're trying to just have their cake and eat it too by saying it has the properties, but they're not constructed until people make them up. It's like, eh, then does it really have the property? Okay. Nine. Opponents may point out that the manifestation of some properties, say of stars, should be earlier than the appearance of any creature. That's just what I was saying. It's like that's very worrisome. However, this objection is based on the assumption that experience is generated by creatures' brains. Oh, so this guy's a panpsychist. Like everything is thinking then. Interesting. Now, are you a panpsychist? This is a hard problem. All right. This is, um, most people are not panpsychists in the West. In other parts of the world, I think panpsychists. Um, panpsychism is much more well liked, but this is that the entire universe is experiencing experiencing things, excuse me, consciously. And so this person is getting out of the problem of mind by being a panpsychist, saying everything is mind, everything. So it's not that there isn't a person there to hear the tree falling; it's that the universe hears the tree fall because the universe is conscious. In some sense, this is the only way that they're going to get out of this. And so this kind of makes sense now what they're doing right here. The assumption that experience is generated by creatures brains. It isn't. It's generated by the universe. Then that's panpsychism. OK, however, this generation relation is removed from the constructivist worldview. Brains or creatures are constructed structures from experiences. Yeah. So it's the experiences are the. um. Yeah. The experiences are prior. That means it's the universe experiencing the experiences. It's not a brain. It's the universe itself. And then they are amalgamed onto brains somehow. Ivan Neo says, yes, it's just a coincidence that breaking brains breaks consciousness. Hi, gang. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. If you want to go hardcore into like certain views, and this is a very hardcore sort of... um constructive his view you're gonna have to do weird things at every certain point um ivan's a streamer I should give ivan a shout out yeah so uh ivan talks science philosophy stuff it's kind of cool go check out his stuff if you like my stuff you might like his stuff but yeah how you doing ivan what's going on yeah so not an assumption but an inference um well i mean you're assuming panpsychism, but like I guess it follows. That does not, nothing really. Um, 
you can't assume constructivism from a panpsychist worldview. So I don't know exactly where they're getting the assumption of panpsychism from, but you know, they're inferring that maybe if the brain isn't doing it, how is it getting done? And then this is a panpsychist worldview. But like, this is interesting. This is where we're getting into some like, this is finally an answer here. What, how all this stuff that was prior actually can make sense if you're a panpsychist, because then the universe is doing the experiences and they're just conglomerating onto certain constructions, which happen to be, you know, people and animals. Okay. So now we're making some sense. You may not like this theory, but you might like this theory. And it's okay to be a panpsychist. It's just a minority view at the moment. <clears throat> Therefore, the periods of experience can be viewed as extending as far back as the manifestation of any properties, say, of stars. Um, any structures, including onto structures that have computers in them, Ivan. <laughs> you disagree and it's not okay? Well, I know. This is what I mean. Like, a lot of people are not panpsychists. It's not a, it is the minority view in the West. Um, and I don't know how it is in, like, the East. I believe it's more accepted in, like, Indian and Indian philosophies, but I, I don't know. Um, but yeah. Considering the situation in a dream, we, once again, helps us to understand this point. We can imagine that a person dreams of herself as the first creature and uh, continues to dream of herself as different creatures along the process of evolution until the appearance of her human body. These creatures, their bodies, are only constructed structures from experiences in the dream. This is the same as understanding our world in the constructivist worldview. Okay, again, what is dreaming us if we are the elements of the dream? That would be reality is dreaming us. Like this universe that we're in is now dreaming us. I mean, they're not saying that, but that's how it goes. Uh, DC, I was watching Grace Hopper lectures earlier. Her chats about computers were epic. Yeah, Grace Hopper knows her stuff. This is the same understanding of the world in the constructivist view. It is reasonable to suppose the dream could start earlier than when the person thinks of herself as the first creature. As this earlier point in time, there is experience in the dream, but no creature in the dream is constructed. In this way, extending the starting point of the experience, the constructivist worldview can ensure that the manifestation of properties is not prior to the appearance of the associated constructants' experiences. Yeah. But, like, now we are in... Now it all makes sense, actually. This all makes a lot more sense, what's going on. Like, all of the stuff I was complaining about, once you go panpsychism, and it's the universe experiencing the world, not us, and we just sort of are there along for the ride, this is all actually not that bad. Like, it's fine. This is just a panpsychist worldview. All right, so 10. My solution is different from Schwartz's solution, which resolves the problem of time by appealing to what he calls retrospective facts. For example, Alioth is a star, is constructed by virtue of our use of language, but can exist before the appearance of language because this is a retrospective fact. Uh, Ivan Neo says, this dream is awfully consistent. You would have to develop physicalism as explanation within the dream to explain reality. Well, yeah, it would be a physicalist dream is what it is. Like the universe is dreaming in a physicalist way. That's all it is. But like, it, it, it still has to be the entire universe dreaming to maintain the physicalism. Um, not us. Like, because of course, if it was up to us, then like, you, we'd have all our private physics for each of us. And that would be very, very, very strange. I mean, it would be, uh, what's it called? Inception, basically. In comparison with Schwartz's solution, the time relation that no property is ever prior to the related constructants in the constructivist worldview is more straightforward. Um, it doesn't add anything to the physics, um, but it is the panpsychist worldview that the universe, we are part of the universe's dream insofar as like we are part of the, well it's the universe that's thinking and we are just parts of like what it is thinking so you could call it a dream but like it's the universe is the thing that's doing the thinking and we are just doing it and so it's just by saying the universe is dreaming us i'm just saying the we are just part of the universe but the thought that we have is not our thought it is the universe's thought that we are just sort of glomming onto that's all it is like we because that's the thing if the universe is pre-construct is already experiencing the world, like the universe is the thing that is experiencing 
itself and it's self-constructing as like everything is just you know going through we are the ones that are there getting the thoughts from the universe because we are lined up with the thoughts in the universe about the world that's what it's doing we are lining our ourselves up and recognizing the thoughts in the universe of those experiences because the experiences are prior but like at these points where we are is where we are experiencing uh we are you know along with the universe experiencing those things because we are where those experiences are taking place in the universe. <laughs> yeah. Panpsychism is a trip. Okay, out of nothing. Uh, Westerhoff and, and Asgar Sita also ask for more explanation about how the constructive chain can come out of nothing. I will address this issue from the angle of form versus matter here. I mean, come on, man. Come on, man. Like, this is ancient. Were you going to do the unmoved mover like Aristotle? Like, come on. I'm just waiting for it. Let's get the Aristotelian view. Form versus matter is hylomorphic. This is Aristotelian theory. 2,500 years ago. According to the constructivist worldview, the world is composed of properties without substance, and each property can be understood as a form without matter. Hence, the world... What's oi? It's just, it's just like, oi... <laughs> Hence, the world can be understood as a network of forms without matter. All right, so we've just got, um, yeah, these are the abstract structures. Um, so scholars usually reject the view that something can come from nothing because they presuppose that a thing is comp a combination of form and matter. Yeah, so this is their presupposing a hylomorphic view from Aristotle. Matter with a new form can only come from matter with an old form rather than from nothing. However, in contrast to the situation of matter which can only be inherited a form without matter it can be created a form is associated with a distinction which brings associated properties forms for example being p and not being p into the world okay so now we're making up forms is what we're doing that's fine where do they come from like like we can make them up but that would be the universe making up new forms but then that would already have to be constructed there and they wouldn't be new i know i'm not sure at the period of time before the occurrence of the distinction, there are no related properties or forms. Thus, a certain form can be created from a stage where there is no such form, and this is a common phenomenon. I just declare that new forms come. They, it's not a platonic where there's a, a realm of forms. You can just, they just come into existence wherever. In a world of form without matter, the platonic uh, reality, the, pl uh, the platonic world, a thing as a bundle of forms without matter can be created from a stage where there is no such thing and no associated forms. Okay. So it just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. At at this earlier stage, earlier stage, what is an earlier stage? There'd be, there may be other forms in the world that are helpful for the gradual development of the form of this in this thing. If we trace all the way down the chain of creation of properties through distinction, we will come to a stage before any creation that there is that, is there is nothing the starting of the construction train may be the occurrence of a more than one very weak indistinct distinction so come on this is the biggest hand waving saying it's coming from nothing but it's really just a very weak indistinct distinction but like what is that that's not well described that's hand waving just trying to avoid that it came out of nothing i mean come on nothing was explained here but i mean to be fair no one can explain this no one anywhere can explain this and they probably there is a good chance no one ever will like why is there something rather than nothing no one knows and no one in our lifetime is going to figure it out and probably no one in the next few generations or after that are going to figure this out either that's the giant question of everything and the idea that you can just say oh yeah it comes from some very weak and indistinct distinction that is nonsense i'm sorry it's like this is the same old thing yeah uh, this is the thing. Maybe one day we'll get there, Ivan Neal. I don't think it's going to be in any time soon. Like, and when I say any time soon, I don't think like any time in the next like, like thousand years or something. Yeah, any answer would be something. But like, this is why I'm annoyed with this is because it's like, come on, this person is obviously smart, whoever wrote this. But like, y y they're trying very hard to hold on to something that they like to, you know, not bite the bullet. This is why, this is what, 
this is the distinction between like good philosophers and bad philosophers. A good philosopher would have bitten the bullet and just be like, yeah, I'm going to do the Aristotelian thing and say, unmoved mover, uh, this stuff came out of nothing. Just bitten the bullet and said, yeah, you're going to have to accept that. This person tried to wiggle their way out. You're, there is no wiggling their way out. There is no wiggling your way out. None. It's not going to happen unless you're smarter than every philosopher in the history of philosophers and basically smarter than all the religious thinkers too because the religious thinkers just say God did it. And that's not usually an acceptable answer for everyone else. So you're going to have to give better than all the religious thinkers and all the like non-religious thinkers. Like, seriously. Okay. Goodman's view related to the starting point of the construction chain is that all constructions are of a kind of remaking from previous worlds. Fine, fine. However, he avoids answering the further question about the starting point of all worlds. My solution is suitable for this further question since the constructivist worldview is about the totality of all Goodman's worlds. Goodman keeps physical space-time in a privileged position and construes different versions as different aspects of the space of the same space-time. However, this is not needed as constructivists should put the constructive relation in a privileged in a pri privileged position, and the construction of spa physical space-time and a physical world is only one of many constructed structures. Hence, the uh, hence other constructed worlds may not be another aspect of the same space-time, rather they may be separated, separate constructed structures, but still in a common construction project. Since all features in these separate structures are constructed, we can trace the total construction chain all, of all features down and understand the chain as coming out of nothing. Um, okay, this is more interesting. They're saying everything is just like, you know, you can take it apart. Everything, including space-time. But where did the experience come from then? Because that's what they were saying in the previous section. Um, if you're going to do the panpsychist thing where the universe is experiencing stuff, you still need where did the first experience come from? Where? Because that would be the raw material of what is doing the construction. And since there's all, and even then, that is prior to space time, but you still need the experience. They can't have it come from nothing if um, you can't do that. Unless you come up here, if you want to say brains or creatures are constructed structures from experiences, what are the experiences? Where did they come from? And so you have to do this right here. Where do the experiences come from? Constructed structures from experiences. If you're going to do constructed structures from experiences, you have to explain the experiences. And if you come down here and say it, it doesn't like uh, you can understand the chain of coming out of nothing. Where did the experiences come from? That's the raw material. You need the raw material. Where did the raw material show up from? And if they're saying it's eternal, that's exactly the same as it came from nothing because that just means it's been around forever. It came out of nothing. It's eternal. It's just the same stuff. Okay. All right. So oh, further issues. Okay. So these were the big problems. Now we've got further issues. Let's see if I can run through these. Oh, Ivan, were you streaming? Yeah, it says you gave me a shout out. That's cool. Thank you. <coughs> what were you streaming? All right. So further issues. Carter is concerned with how the constructed external objects can gain properties and sustain. My answer is that they sustain in a model built from experience. We intermittently uh, see right here, right here built from experience this is the raw material of uh this panpsychist worldview this constructivist worldview experience is fundamental okay but then where did the experience come from and you can't say come from nothing because it's literally like right here is like eh, coming out of nothing but where did you get the experience from where all right we intermittently add properties to these objects their existence depends on the occurrence of experience Existence depends on the occurrence of experience. Come on. But they are not in the mind. Yeah, they're part of the universe. In part one of the argument, my view is to close is close to that of the natural monism, which views experience as foundational existence. What happened? Something happened. Oh, you're all over the map. <laughs> Sorry, I saw it uh, over on the other screen. 
Ivan says, I was all over the map. Education, music, rationality, the fact that we often present evidence for evolution, but not the explicit inference, changing laws about AI art. Well, that is a massive stream then. So yeah, foundational experience right there. For example, Bertrand Russell stated that the stuff of the world consists of things like whiteness rather than the objects having the property of being white. Yes, yeah, so Russellian stuff. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by something. What's going on? Am I losing frames? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm okay. Okay. Um, however, in part two, I argue that even experience is not foundational. Uh, because each particular experience is also constructed. Part 2's answer to Carter's question of what constitutes experience. The occurrence of different experiences construct properties for one another. As argued above, a self or perceived objects are not required by experience, just like the situation in a dream where the experience in the dream is not located in any place in the garden or in the body that is in the dream. Experiences are not located in any place in the constructed space-time. Yeah, they are the universe. They are not in the space-time. They are part of the universe. The universe is experiencing these things, not us. We just happen to be in the same place and time as the experience, and we are therefore we are also experiencing it. Okay, 14. Kletzel has some doubts regarding the connection between different people's experience. However, these doubts can also apply to the connection between different experiences in Group A. For example, do two red, red spots in different experiences of Group A, or at least in a different location of the same visual experiences, experience match? Yeah, so if like I put a... Uh, blue dot here and the same blue dot here like do those do th these blue dots match they are two separate occurrences at different times or locations without a unifying self or subject to make the judgment they are not identical rather they match only in the sense that they are classified under the category red or blue in my case Based on a certain kind of classification, the red in my experience and the red in your experience are both red and match. The difference between these two cases is that of degree. More, moreover, an experience sharing some content with another experience in group A only means that the latter believes that the former has occurred or can reproduce, say, a visual image in the former. However, this can also happen between two experiences in group B. One of my experiences believes that some of your experiences can happen. Moreover, in my experience, I also try to imagine, for example, the visual image in your experience. This imagined Im visual image in my experience should also count be counted as a rep reproduction of the visual image in your experience. According to a certain classification of color or shapes, we can say that my visual image matches your visual image. Yeah, like this is fine. Like you can just say, look, based on, <coughs> ooh, losing it. Based on how you look at the world, you can classify things as falling under like certain categories. And then like you can say, this is how I see it. It's also how they see it. it you can define yourself fine. Like this is okay. In his question two, Kletzel doubts that we can explain understanding by virtue of linguistic experience. Constructivists as well as conventionalists should understand meaning or propositions as constructed from our use of language, that is, our behaviors related to symbols. Experiences can be constructed as linguistic experiences when a model containing concepts can be constructed from the regularity regarding how symbols appear repeatedly on a certain occasions. All right, so this is actually a very uh, classic view. You have a you are taught words by association with uh, stuff. This is a uh, anti Wittgensteinian. Wittgenstein did not like this theory, where it's like a regularity. It's a human view of language. The intellectual layer can be understood as the layer of the model. Um, Ivan Yev says neural nets are classifiers under this sort of picture. Neural nets are redundant explanations. Yeah, that's fine. But like, that's because they had to be trained. And so like you're, you're once you train the thing on the world, then it's only getting back to the thing you trained it on. It's not fine. Well, I mean, what's not fine? Like the theory here or that neural nets are classifiers. I mean, neural nets have to be trained. I mean, I'm not wrong about that. Are you saying like un, uh, like not reinforced trained, not, not trained neural nets? Oh yes. This philosophy is obliterated by neural science. Well, I think that's unfair. Like you couldn't, like I was saying, this goes, this, if this was a bit more honest, oh, neural nets can train themselves. Well, don't you need to like set them on things? Like I don't, you need to give them like training data and whatnot, but still, yeah, you can do it unsupervised. Um, this can be related to other philosophies. I don't love this presentation of it, but this can be related to other philosophies that, you know, have better, um, 
ha have a stronger theoretical backing than like this is giving here. So this is like not as like I'm kind of going through it very quickly, but this can be done uh, more like in more depth. And so th these are clearly just responses to questions. They're short, but the problem is they're kind of funky. No, no, you can have opinions. I have no problem with people have, having opinions that don't like things. Like, I like things. Other people do not like things. That is okay. Um, like, really. Like, you don't have to love everything. But like, like I said, this can be done in a better way. And so you can say, well, it would be destroyed by neural nets. It's like in destroyed by regular co cognitive neuroscience. No, there are versions of this that won't be. Like, just because this version here is not great, it can be, a lot of this stuff can be salvaged. Like, a lot of it. It's just, this one is not, um, like, this is what I was saying over here. This, when I was saying, basically, they should have uh, bit the bullet and just said, hey, yeah, we're going to say um, something comes out of nothing. Because they, they're thinking they can just, like, solve, why is there anything in the universe here? Like, that's not going to not going to fly. It's not going to fly. So this person's presentation is not great, but a lot of this other stuff, it can be done better. Okay. After listening to a speech, people familiar with the language can get the model of concepts and continue to state something involving concepts in the model. People who do not know the language can do neither. This, their behavior tells others whether they can understand the speech. Yeah, so this person is doing a uh, behaviorist theory thing here, but um, it's not going to I don't think the philosophy behind a lot of this uh, training is actually going to work, but that's okay. Kletzel also questions how theoretical properties which are only constructed from linguistic experiences play their role. For example, we construct LC properties related to quantum mechanics from descriptions of quantum mechanics. These LC properties do not need to affect objects independent of experiences. Rather, these LC properties affect affect constructed objects. More precisely, in the constructivist worldview, the regularities between LC properties and constructed objects remain. Moreover, the regularities between constructed objects and phenomenal experiences all also remain. Therefore, we can observe that phenomenal experience is affected by LC properties. Okay, whatever. Like, they're just saying, I don't know exactly what their LC properties are, but like, whatever, I'll have to take their word for that there. I don't know the terms. 17. In comparison to Schwartz's responses to the two challenges he discusses, my constructivism is more thorough. By extending the constructins from language to experience, the ex constructivist worldview can explain the construction of properties in all of time in a straightforward way. If a single uniform mechanism constructive relation to explain all features can be used, dividing features into categories, for example, the cognitively constructed versus the physically constructed becomes unnecessary. Yeah, because the experiences are fundamental, they exist in the universe already, you don't need to cognitively or physically construct them anymore. Like, this is actually, like, a good answer, because once you understand the background theory, then there is another, you may not like panpsychism, but, like, this do, is not a problem for panpsychism. This is what panpsychism, panpsychism solves very well. Okay, 18. Moreover, how to draw the line between the two categories is also a complex issue. Uh, Schwartz construes the difficulty in drawing a line as a support, of, in, as a support for conventionalism. He argues that, from the constructivist point of view, it is either impossible or, impossible or even nonsensical to draw such a, like, a line. So that's between conventionalism and what? Um, Non-conventionalism? Well, we'll see. However, the constructivist worldview also has a clear answer to the boundary line associated with construction by language. Oh, okay, convention and construction and language. How do you understand what's constructed in language? First, LC properties are in the scope of construction by language. The construction of LC properties depend on our use of language. Section PC properties are outside the scope of construction by language. Constructivist views based on conceptualization usually conflate construction by language and construction affected by language. For example, we have PC whiteness, the scope of which may be affected by our own conventions in using the term white. However, suppose that it happens to be that the people before the appearance of language construe the same range of co colors as white as we do. The PC whiteness constructed by us should be the same as the PC whiteness constructed by people before the appearance of language. Hence, the construction of PC whiteness does not depend on the use of la using language and is only affected by the way we use related terms. Okay, so they're talking about like the subjective whiteness and then how we think about it when we think about white. We bring in more stuff. That's okay. 
Okay, 19. Saida identifies several advantages of realism in comparison to phenomenalism or the constructivist worldview. Yeah, so this is the phenomenalism is saying the phenomenon themselves is, um, that's what's real. So the constructivist worldview is like the objects in the world are real in the realist worldview. The constructivist is talking about experiences or the phenomena of the experiences that you get, um, View, via the constructivist worldview, the uh, panpsychism. First, Sita in chapter seven argues that we can transcend the realm of experience by virtue of regular by regularity. So this is more of a scientific worldview. There's a regularity in the world, um, and that's what we are getting past just of our experiences, and we know what the actual objects in the world are. However, all scientific regularities can also be constructed in the constructivist worldview. The regularities which are considered either show themselves in observational experience or are, or are described by certain theories using natural langu language or formal language, for example, physical formulas. Constructivists can find a constructans, associated experience, or the use of language to construct these regularities. Regularity is not helpful in transcending the realm of experience. All right, this is not actually a great answer they're just saying well we can do it too but they're saying um it's just we, we can make our constructions but then th then what is the virtue of regularity well they're saying that doesn't explain regularity you're just saying you can explain it in terms of construction but what is the point of um science then like what does science actually get at can you explain things with science um what is the what is the truth of science what is science getting to and what is the virtue of regularity then? Like, because the world it does seem to have physical regularities. The fact that you can say that they are all constructed um, in the constructivist worldview does not explain why they are the way they are, that they are regular. It does not explain the truths of science. It just explains that you can build them up out of like raw materials. So I, I don't think this is a good answer to this uh, question here. Okay. Second, Sita argues that realism can provide an explanation for the occurrence of experience by causal rela relations. <laughs> no, no, you can't, Sita. No, you can't. You cannot do that, Sita. You're just wrong. Yeah. However, this explanation is dubious because of the hard problem, which questions how how experience is generated from the activities of the brain. And this is the hard problem of consciousness. Thank you, Chalmers. Like, no, you can't, Sita. You're not doing that. <laughs> You're not smarter than David Chalmers. <laughs> Scholars, are, well, there's an argument, big argument. People agree with David Chalmers. People don't agree. But this goes back to Descartes, um, like dualism and not whatever. This is not that new of a debate. No one here is solving that. Scholars are yet to provide a satisfactory answer to this. No, that's true. In contrast, the construct constructivist worldview avoids the hard problem because it removes the generation relation. Yeah, you are a panpsychist. You should admit it. Admit it. Moreover, since the constructivist worldview retains regularities, for example, the connection between a loud noise fall and falling constructed furniture. <laughs> so this is what I was saying. This is tree falls in the forest crap. That's what this is. The connection between a loud noise and falling constructed furniture. There is no irregular chaos and we can still predict future events. Yeah, come on. So this is exactly what was going on. But all right, but like this seed is just wrong here. The uh, whoever this uh, criticism of the author was, they are wrong. Third, according to Sita, uh, <coughs> realism can ex explain intersubjective coherence. Really, it can. That's amazing. In the constructivist worldview, after removing separate ob separate subjects, we should see the construction from the world of the world from the totality of experience as a common project. Therefore, it is understandable that there is intersubjective coherence. Panpsychism for the win. Like, exactly. Like, if everything's having the same thoughts, then of course the world is like, it works all together. <laughs> like, of clearly, it's all the universe thinking. And so, therefore, it is understandable that there is coherence. Yeah, it's funny. Okay. Conrad Werner provides a new angle for addressing the problem of stuff. Problem of stuff. What is this? Uh, George Carlin? Everyone got their stuff. How come I don't know your thoughts, uh, No Gray Zero? Um, well, have you tried thinking very hard? <coughs> Maybe you do, and you just didn't realize it. Like, I'm beaming my thoughts through Twitch to you now via my words. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Maybe learn. Well, okay there, Plato. Learning is just recalling the recollection theory of knowledge. Okay. It's all it ever was. Just go platonic. I mean, that is Plato's theory. Like, you can't go a whole lot older in terms of Western philosophy. <coughs> in section 18, he argues that constructivism is a metaphysical rather than an epistemological project. Okay, that, well, that's what I've been kind of saying. Um, in a metaphysical project, we should be allowed to assume some entities, for example, the stuff at the starting point of the theory. Well, they were just saying experience. I mean, that is the stuff of the world. However, after the constructivist worldview removes the independence of experience and independence existence as structural features, the distinction between metaphysics and epistemology is no longer clear-cut. Well, that's fair. There's always uh, difficulties at the edge of metaphysics and epistemology. Since there's no experience-independent layer, a metaphysical project cannot focus on objective features, and will turn to investigate some basic structural features of the world. The basic structural features always include interaction with experience, and this is and this was already in the scope of epistemology. Consequently, Werner's argument based on the distinction between metaphysics and epistemology gains less credibility. I mean, this is right. According, like, I agree with the author here. It's just a little hand wavy. I'd have to see what the uh, actual criticism was. But like, the author's right. Basically, once you get into like the the way the world in like the pantheon of philosophy is set up, is like, look at the very top, you have logical possibility, which is just like pure logical con uh, conceivability. Then below that is we have this sort of like metaphysical realm where it's like there's things that like they're conceivable, but they're stupid. Like no one, there's no reason to think they're actually the case. So there's some sort of like world of like part of the universe that we consider metaphysical that it has like these structural features. And then there's like below that is like, you know, what we know about the world like what we can actually know and maybe there's some like bigger things that are metaphysical above that and in this whole realm of possibility that's like just logically governed that we can think about without losing our minds but like at the edge it's gonna get hazy like of course yeah conceivable but like stupid like if you want to say like the universe is gonna like it was constructed it was constructed three seconds ago and all of our histories and whatnot you know we're all just like didn't exist before three seconds ago and we were just given it and it was just put into play three seconds ago and when everything that happened before we're just imagining and it, but now really is real but like 10 seconds ago wasn't like that's stupid like no one thinks that like seriously it's possible like it is a logical possibility that some god just started the universe 20 seconds ago now and gave us all these like back histories but like why would like no one actually thinks that's a good idea Ivan Neal, how dare they cite Carnap? They are not worthy enough to mention his name. No, see, that's the thing. Everyone loves Carnap. They cited Carnap. They cited Chalmers. Uh, Nelson Goodman, this is another massive philosopher. Um, E.J. Lowe, again. Oh, um, Ivan Neal, that paper you were thinking of, this or, uh, journal right here called Ratio, you might look at, and you might also look at Episteme. Um a journal called Episteme, before I forget. Maybe that's where you want to, uh, like, if you're working on your um, evolution and uh, Bayesian epistemology thing, look at Episteme, because that is talking about, that's an epistemology journal, and basically, if you're going to, like, stick to your guns with Bayesian epistemology, then you might think about sending that to an epistemology journal. And then you say, given very strong Bayesian epistemology leanings, this is what happens. But since you're leaning right into the epistemology for Bayesian epistemology, then yeah. Again, this person basically, uh, in this article right here, they're just, they're quoting very big names. So I don't know who the Schwartz person is, but like, and I don't know who fi uh, this one is. The possibility of truth by convention, like, but like they're, Quoting good people. Yeah. You just got evidence in ev evolution by Elliot Sober. I don't think Elliot Sober does covers Bayesian epistemology. Let me think. Do I know anything about that? I, I severely doubt that he does. So uh, you're still going to like, you'll have plenty to look at, but I don't think uh, he's going to cover that. Okay. So what do I think about this? Um, I think this person doesn't know enough philosophy, but I mean, I think everyone doesn't know enough philosophy. So that's actually not really a great criticism. It's, um, 
Not bad, actually. It's actually, I, I've been giving this person a lot of shit. They don't understand where their theories are coming from. They don't understand the history of their theories. They said some very dumb things. Very dumb. That doesn't make them wrong. Like, actually, they are wrong, but like that doesn't make them wrong. You can take this sort of thing. This person just has to realize where their theories are coming from. And then they could say, hey, look, basically, we're doing a platonic reality with a few different, with, um panpsychist leanings and uh a few more things thrown in that's what this is that doesn't make it good or right it just means like you can put this paper this constructivism within the pantheon of like other philosophies the problem is they didn't really they don't know enough of the uh, background material to do that and so every so often they're re they're you know what they tried to do broke down like this part here just was absolutely terrible out of nothing is like no it's just no just no, just no, bad, like bad, 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 bad. Um, so, cause like basically that was just bad, but, um, <laughs> so, um, like that part was bad, but like, whatever, all of these things are actually fi like, what's funny is these are all fixable problems. You're just going to end up relating them to like known theories which have people on both sides of the debate and then it's going to be harder to just be like oh this is the right answer because then you're going to have to deal with all the people that have, they have all their arguments do I, like do I have a problem with like a constructivist worldview no it's just you have to realize what you're actually um arguing you're arguing for a panpsychist worldview um with like s some other metaphysics here like that's just how it is like that's okay like if you want to be panpsychist fine I know a lot of people that don't like and they are the majority so you're gonna be in a minority view but that's all right like i'm i have panpsychist leanings i don't actually care for the theory i get annoyed with uh naive physicalism so like i will defend panpsychism like in this case like i am defending panpsychism here i'm saying it is a legitimate way of viewing the world defending this because i don't love all the things about physicalism either um but this per like that's the only problem here is that this person needs to um like th they have not placed what they are thinking in the proper um uh you know in the proper uh philosophical setting 